The first thing I want to talk about is open source intelligence, OSINT. And this is basically agencies of the U.S. government, including the CIA and others, that are doing overt as opposed to covert intelligence by just basically data mining publicly available resources that are out there. They're doing advanced analysis, uh, data mining tools, generating actionable and predictive intelligence. It's used in law enforcement. It's used by Homeland Security, state and national security, as well as business intelligence. Now realize that this has nothing to do with open source software or even public intelligence. OSINT is the gathering and analysis of information from public or open sources. Typically, you divide this up into several categories. For example, you've got media and internet. I'll make that one category, okay? Print media, magazines, uh, radio, AM, FM radio, television, everything on the internet, okay? Online publications, blogging, all the stuff on YouTube and social media websites. By the way, later on, we're going to look at the top 10 in 2017 social media sites and the top 10 search engines, which you need to be aware of as part of your application security and URL filtering. Obviously, this is kind of the number one source for open source intelligence. Then we have public government data, government reports, uh, hearings on C-SPAN, for example, transcripts, uh, directories, publications from conferences, from speeches, things that are on .gov websites. There's also professional and academic publications, academic journals, medical conferences, for example, symposiums, academic papers, papers that are written by master's candidates and PhD candidates, dissertations and theses. Then there's commercial data, commercial images, financial industrial reports, assessments, and database information that's readily available. And then other documentation is just kind of a gray area. Uh, it can be called gray literature. It can be technical reports, working papers, information on patents, business documents, works that are unpublished, like unpublished dissertations, and of course, a wide variety of different types of newsletters. And this, by the way, is going to be open source intelligence for malicious attackers as well. Okay, so keep that in mind. I'm up here at CIA.gov, and under News and Information here at the CIA's public website, you can see intelligence, okay, open source intelligence, talking about OSINT, where it's drawn from. I kind of mentioned this. I left out uh, photos, uh, geospatial information, okay, imagery products, maps like Google Maps, for example, think tank studies, didn't mention that. So they just tell you that, you know, the DNI Open Source Center, where the CIA collects and produces and promotes open source intelligence through their DNI Open Source Center, the OSC. So definitely a website to add to the many websites. Hopefully throughout this entire training series, every time I go on a web safari, you're adding that to your list of resources. Uh, and so it should be a pretty lengthy list by now. And we're going to keep adding to it as we go through this course. Something else you want to know for a wide variety of reasons, uh, acceptable use policy, URL filtering, content filtering, and social engineering purposes are the top social media sites. And this is as of May 2017. So this is a few months ago. Next to the actual media site, we also see if their numbers are up or down. Okay, so you can see number one and number two, Facebook and YouTube. And as of May, they were on the uptick. Okay. Twitter is on the downtick. I think if you deal with Twitter, you realize that that's a phenomenon, okay? There's also Reddit and Pinterest and Instagram, and then LinkedIn, Tumblr, Yelp, and Quora. So those are the top 10. And, you know, as a security practitioner dealing with layer five through seven security, content security, acceptable use policies, and URL filtering, uh, you need to be aware of these media sites and the emerging sites that come up. Maybe not on the top 10 list, but you want to investigate what are some of the new and emerging social media sites. It also wouldn't hurt to go out and get a Tor browser and kind of start doing some investigation on the dark web and the deep web into some of the popular sites there as well. You know, know your enemy. A lot of information can be gathered by using DNS records and the Whois protocol. Here you can see a Whois command run on a machine for 
uh, www.cisco.com provided by whois.aaron.net. The WHOIS protocol queries servers operated by the regional internet registries that store data about every resource, IP address, and or domain name registered on the internet. So readily available to the cracker and the malicious hacker are the name and owner of the company, the address of the owner company, uh, the IP range that it belongs to, a contact phone number, contact email, administrator's name, and the name servers. This can also be company information of domains, but also personal domains that are registered. Now, one of the things that can be done to counteract this is using what's called private registration. Now, ICANN, I-C-A-N-N, -N, has been working to change who is to make it more private and, and safer. Okay, but they just can't get consensus among the major stakeholders. Okay, it it's kind of relates to the fact that why on the internet OCSP just doesn't work like it should because they just can't get the backing of the browser vendors. Okay, they're not willing to sacrifice interoperability and connectability with security. So the same thing here. Now most registrars offer for a fee private domain registration, and that can mitigate some risk because. Uh, it can spoof your email address and your post address and your phone number. So, for example, if you were with Network Solutions, a very popular company, they would change your email address every 10 days. They'll change the postal address to their own address, okay, their own registrar, and the same thing with the phone number. The challenge is that the spammers and the direct marketers and identity thieves and other cyber criminals can also hide behind the anonymous domain registrations by privately registering all of their phony domains, okay? So it makes it difficult to trace the responsibility of some of those attackers. So that's who is a great source of information, both nefarious and benign. Here's the top 10 search engines. You should be aware of this for all the same reasons I mentioned earlier of knowing the top 10 social networking sites, which, you know, are heavily mined by commercial organizations. They're heavily mined by government agencies. Part of the open source intelligence, the OSINT, you know, prime candidates are those sites as well as these search engines. Most of these search engines have their own kind of proprietary algorithms and engines, but they can be data mined and analyzed as well. So here's the top 10. I just got through watching the final episode of Halt and Catch Fire on AMC about, you know, the birth of the World Wide Web, basically. And it was the final episode where the protagonist, his company, he pretty much realized that they didn't have a chance because their whole goal was to get their web browser, their indexing site into the Netscape Navigator. So they got the beta copy of Netscape Navigator and loaded it up and noticed that Yahoo already had a button on <laughs> the Netscape Navigator, which interestingly, I taught a class decades ago and it was on the World Wide Web and we had the Netscape Navigator and we had the Yahoo button, just like the show said. So it kind of took me back in time to my first training gig on Wednesday nights uh, for a company called Executrain. So that's where Yahoo came from. And again, you know, they're still number three, right? Bing, which is Microsoft's search engine. And then there's Ask and yes, AOL still around, still around. They kind of go back to that same time. Uh, DuckDuckGo, a, a pretty secure search engine. And then a couple of other ones. And then finally, I want to talk about Wolfram Alpha. It's not really a search engine, but it's, it's top 10. And I think I want you to kind of know about it. It's a computational knowledge-based search engine developed by Stephen Wolfram. It's been around since 2009, and it's different than these other search engines because it provides direct answers to factual questions. Let's go take a look. So here it is, Wolfram Alpha, computational knowledge engine. And of course, you can say, what do you want to calculate or know about? So, you know, we might want to know about our programming because that can be used in our discipline. So we'll type in R programming, and it says R is a programming language, basic properties. There's the official website. There's the logo. It describes it from Wikipedia. Okay. Uh, you can see the page hits history, which is interesting, and then some related queries. Other programming languages like Lua, for example, you can actually find Lua in the Cisco IPS sensor where you can do your customized 
policies uh, in your firewall and your sensor. And it also shows the Frink programming language. So if you go back up here, let's go back to the main site. Examples is pretty cool. Click on that, it'll show you, you know, what do you want to ask about? Mathematics, words and linguistics, units and measures, step-by-step -step solutions. Wouldn't hurt to go and brush up on your statistics. That always comes in handy for quantitative analysis. We'll actually talk about uh, statistical inference and regression testing in this particular live lessons, okay? You know, image input, culture and media, there's a original cast of Star Trek, and it's number 10 on the list of most popular search engines out there. Wolfram Alpha.